Before they begin, Bob and Ray are glad to read the following bulletin from the Office of Fluctuation Control and Sealing Repairs, Bureau of Edible Condiments, Soluble, Insoluble, and Indigestible Fats and Glutinous Derivatives, Washington, D.C. Directive 94345-56201. As of September 1st, September 1st, 1954, the price of groundhog meat will be fixed at a level... A little, little higher than the price of groundhog meat on October 15th, 1907. 1907, with the exception of the low-level water route outlined in the Bureau's directions of 1916, for finding the Kansas City Stockyards note slightly higher west of the Rockies. Bob and Ray are glad to read this as a public service. Now here's the picture all America has been waiting for. Now at last, it can be told. Now for the first time, someone dares tell this different story. You'll be shocked. You'll be thrilled. You'll laugh. You'll cry. You'll wish you stayed home. When you see Repulsive Pictures' greatest triumph... Grub, the story of food. It took five years to film this moving spectacle. Imagine the stark realism of tons of roast beef consumed by 5,000 extras. See 1,500 screaming babies waiting for their strained spinach. See tons and tons of frozen food. Women fought for. Men died for. Grub. Grub stars Sherman L. Sturdley as fearless Fig Leone. Marsha Van Allshot as luscious Lucretia. Plus Jonas Lattimore as the kindly old grocer. And introduces Barry Campbell as Fig Leone's son, Mario, who'll sing his way into your heart. Can't you hear me calling Caroline? Now listen to an unforgettable scene from the picture Grub. Fig Leone has just been refused admittance to the cafeteria by Lucretia. You mean I... I won't have my grub today. I'm sorry, Figlione. If it were anyone but you. But you've always given me my grub, Lucretia. But today, Figlione, you have no ticket. If you were to be challenged in the grub line and you had no ticket, it would mean instant death. But, uh, Lucretia, you don't understand. I must have my grub. Yes, seen such as this are many in Repulsive Pictures' latest release. Filmed in various shades of gray, be sure and see Grub, the story of food. Produced by the same studio which gave you the moving vehicle, Crosstown Bus. See Grub, the story of food, opening soon at your neighborhood theater. Once again, it's time for Matt Neffer, Boy Spot Welder. Brought to you by stuff you put in a glass that fizzes up and gets all over your suit and everything. Matt's trying days at the aircraft plant are over now. He's between jobs and sitting in his tastefully appointed apartment. He hears the doorbell ring and his friend Todd enters. Todd, come in. Yes, Matt. I hurried over when I... Discovered you were between jobs. <laughs> it's a nice way of putting it. Actually, <laughs> here I am, the world's champion spot welder, and I'm out of work, Todd. Well, that job at the aircraft plant is over now, Matt, but as champion welder, I'm sure you'll get another job very quickly. Out here in the back entry, Todd. Yes. Mm -hmm. Boy, it's cold out here. Yes, there's a nip in the air. Hey, don't have any heat out here, Todd. Well, it does keep to... the vegetables and apples nice yeah, and cold. that's what we use it for. And in the summer, it's always cool. In the winter, it's cold here. In the summer, it's always cool. Do you come out here and sit in the vestibule in the summertime very often? No, we don't call it that. We just call it the back entry, Todd. Mm. I do sit out here often in the summer months. <laughs> well, Matt, I, I wonder just what's been going through your mind since your last day at the aircraft plant. Whether or not you've had time to think about the future, to, 
to plan on what you're going to do now and, well, to get yourself busy I'm here, with... Todd, in the sewing room on the second floor. Right. Second floor, did you say, Matt? Right. That would be two flights. No, no. Just the second floor. No, come back down. Oh, I've gone one too many. Right. Now, stop right at this landing. That's it. Now in here. Straight down the hall. Right or left? Matt. Straight down the hall. You can't miss me. I'm here by the window. See? Here I am. I see you now, yes. Yeah. You're well, looking out the window, Matt. Yes. The reason I came up to this room, I get a wonderful view of my backyard and... The yard next door. Uh, Todd, uh, do you notice anything peculiar over there? Something that the police should be told about? Well, let me let me look, Matt. I I've seen that backyard a good many times. I've never noticed anything particularly unusual. No, no, I I don't see anything there. I don't either. So I guess I won't call the cops. Leisure has overtaken Matt Neffer as he struggles to find something to keep him busy until the next spot welding job. He and his friend Todd talk long into the night. Next time, join us when we hear Matt say, Over here in the dumb waiter, Todd. In the next episode of Matt Neffer, Boy Spot Welder. Now it's time for just Fancy Dan, the Barber of Hartsdale. As we look in on Just Fancy Dan, we see him by his barber chair, attired in purple corduroy trousers, a kind of beige suede shoes, and a real gone blue hat. He's talking to Pliny, who's in the chair. Well, Pliny, you've had your troubles, all right. Just want to say... We're almighty grateful for what you've done. Well, Pliny, it's nothing that any barber wouldn't have done. Oh, shucks, no. Out. It's not that. What are you talk. grateful about? Everything We're all done. grateful. I want to tell you that the wife is grateful, too. How's your wife feel about all I've done for your family, Pliny? She's grateful. Well, I'm sorry. Kids are almighty grateful, Plan, too. And I'll bet the kids are quite appreciative of all They want to appreciate. They appreciate everything you've done. You just turn a little bit this way. What's all that right, you Dan. say about appreciating, Pliny? I say we appreciate it. Well, I don't What want you've no, done for us. Don't We're almighty no grateful. Thanks for nothing I did. Well, it's something that should be said, and I'm well, glad to say it. I'm how's grateful. How's your wife? Is she grateful She's the way grateful. you are? She's grateful. Well, I'm sure she should be, and all your kids, too. Kids are grateful. We're almighty grateful to you, Dan. Well, I didn't do much of nothing for you, Pliny. I just tried to help you out over that tough spot you were getting uh, getting into there. Just one thing I want to say to you, Dan. Okay, let me get the left side of the sideburns there. One thing I want to say to you. You want to say any one thing to me, Pliny, before right. I... We're grateful. Well, it's, it's certainly nothing I wasn't happy to do, I'll tell you that. I like to stick my nose in people's business. Wait a minute. Kind of... Oh... Did you nick me a little? Oh, it seemed like I did, yeah. Well, it's kind of flowing there. Lie well, down. I've had a full and happy life. Oh, now, Pliny, don't go talking like that. Lie down on the floor, oh, so... All right, Dad. Well, We're all grateful to oh, you. Oh, now, Pliny, you're going to pull through, all right. We're all mighty grateful, Dan. Just got so... Your wife grateful, too, yes, Pliny? Yes, she's grateful. And the I kids suppose are all grateful. The kids and your wife and you are, just can't thank me enough for all I've done for you. Getting quite weak now, Dan. Yeah, let me put this pillow under your feet. I always say get your feet up higher than your head in cases like this. I, I certainly... That's right now. I didn't mean to nick you that way, Pliny. Well... Accidents will happen, Dan. Oh, of course. We're all mighty grateful oh, come for what now. you've done. Don't you talk that way. Yeah, I've had I'll a just... full, rich, and happy life. Well, I'll I want just... to say goodbye to you, Dan. I'll cauterize this Before I go, this, though, no I want time. to say one thing. Yeah, you want to say anything, Pliny? Right. What is it? I'm grateful. Something about you being grateful, your That's wife, right. kids, and everybody, I suppose. We're all mighty grateful. I'm glad you're grateful. <laughs> Yes, we're all mighty grateful. We've been listening to Just Fancy Dan, the plain barber of Hartsdale. And now 
it's time for King Yukon of the Northwest. <gasps> King Yukon is a big, beautiful dog. <gasps> And, of course, he belongs to the great sergeant of the Northwest Mounted Police, the late, great Sergeant Clarence E. McGillicuddy. As we look in on Sergeant McGillicuddy, oh. our down king, King Yukon is right at his heels as they make their way into Dawson. And we hear... Come on, dog. Got to ride into Dawson for supplies. A sergeant there. Yes, dog? I'm not the dog there. I am Pierre, oh, the, yeah. Pierre, the half-breed on it there. Yes, Pierre. Hey, what was you doing on top of that dog there? You was taking him on top of the town there with the big, uh... What's the matter with that dog there? Well, Pierre, nothing's the matter with the dog. We were just striking down a group of desperate criminals. Oh. Oh, you mean some was, uh... Take the pelt from on top They've of the traps They've been stealing there. the pelts out of the traps, Pierre, and we're here to straighten out the whole thing. Oh. Get that dog away on it. There. I'll Down pick him boy. on top of the chobs there. Down, boy. I see you don't like dogs, Pierre. I don't like a dog that was growl on top of me there. He never barks or growls unless he knows there's something that he shouldn't like about I the I got person. half pound hamburger on top of the back pocket. That's what he oh, was smelling. Oh, that's probably the reason. Down, uh, boy. It was not that... I will kick that dog there. You don't know, talk him off there. Well, we've got to be getting Talk him off me there. Come on, boy. Down. Hey, Sergeant. Uh, he is pretty mean. Hey, Sergeant. Uh, oh, he's going after me now. Wait just a minute. Down, boy. Why you have a dog like that, Sergeant? It was making trouble all the time. I don't know. They just assigned him to me. I was get get him loose there on top of the woods. Uh, down. Down, boy. Have you been having any trouble with your pelts, Pierre? Yeah, they was not hold up these pans there. I was having an awful time on top of the cold weather. You have been listening to King Yukon, the great dog, and his friend, Sergeant Clarence McKillicuddy of the Northwest Mounted Police, all brought to you by someone. Hello again, everyone. This is Mary Magoon. It's so good to talk to you all again. Well, now that it's time that we all think of food and so forth, I thought I should like to talk briefly about a favorite salad of mine. I know that salads are playing an ever-increasing role in serving of foods in fine restaurants and so forth. That's why I have today a favorite recipe of mine that I'd like to give you all now. It's called frozen ginger ale salad, and this is how I make it. First, you take a huge crock, and uh, I fill it with the contents of a quart bottle of ginger ale. Either pale or golden makes no difference. You just pour it in. Then I take a head of lettuce, Boston, or iceberg, or romaine, and I shred that and put that into the crock containing the ginger ale. Then I swish it all around until it's thoroughly swished. I get to giggling on that. <laughs> it's so much fun. You can wear a rubber glove if you so choose. Now, after it's thoroughly swished, I take a marshmallow and I cube it. And that will keep you busy. <laughs> and uh, after that's been cubed, friends, you put that in too. Then I take a chocolate bar with almonds and I remove the almonds and break the chocolate up into little bits and put that in too. Then I swish it all together and uh, when it's completely swished and settles down a little into the crock, I pour it off into a mold made in the likeness of a dear friend of mine. Then I take it up and put it in the freezing compartment of my refrigerator. Now, after it's hard, and you can tell uh, when it's hard because it will be hard when you touch it, you see, uh, you take it out and you chip it into individual servings, serve it with argyle sock sauce and garnish with pimento. Well, that's about it. You serve that to your family and I know they'll really appreciate it. It's a dish fit for a king. Time again for Mr. Trace, keener than most persons. 
Today, the surly old investigator draws from his files the folder marked The Peg Leg Man Murder Clue. It's late of an afternoon in some season, and in his office, Spike Delancey expostulates. Look here, boss. In my sandwich, worms. Uh, what's that spike, you they say? They look like worms. Oh. Saints preservus, boss. You don't suppose that somebody's trying to, to get me, boss? I would say this is a plot of some kind, Spike. <laughs> Something more deadly than anything that I man could hate imagine. I worms in my sandwich, boss. Spike, I think the heat is been getting you a little bit. Here, sit down by the air conditioner and cool off. All right, boss. Here, let me pour you a glass of cold water from the water cooler. Thank you, boss. You wouldn't be after having a little beer, would you, boss? I think there's some in the cooler, Spike. Fine. Thank you, sir. I'll go help myself, boss. You do that, Spike. Meanwhile, you look for... Uh, why, <laughs> Spike... My teeth almost came out, boss. <laughs> I was saying clues. Clues. Right, Spike. I'll look through my report on the last case. Hmm. Nothing in here about sandwiches. Nothing in here about murder. Save the service, boss. The door, Spike. Do you want me to open it, boss? I think you'd better. Someone evidently seeks to enter through the attic. Wait. All right, boss. Why, who are you? Lurking there behind the silken curtains which cover the door to my air-conditioned office. I'm not lurking, sir. I'm right here. I Spike. want to talk to you. Spike, it looks like some kind of a peg-legged person. Saints preserve. A seafaring us. man, perhaps. Obviously so, boss. Yes. Look, he has a hook to in one arm. He has an evil glint in his eye. Saints preserve us. I wonder why he's come here, Spike, and why I'm... he stands there in the doorway, looking at us in contemplation, as if at any moment he might attack in some way. Or else, maybe he's here asking for help, wanting us to help him. Say... No, it's not for help. He's here to fire at us, Spike. Say, it's preserve us, boss. Yes, Let's I quickly deduce that. down and back of the fact. desk. All right, it's going to be open warfare. <laughs> to talk to ye, both of ye. Us, sir? Yes, ye, both of ye. Well, come in and sit down. Say, it's preserve us, boss. This I don't like, like the looks of this. like a bad crime, Spike. Here, I'll sit here. I think I'll call this case the peg leg Man Murder Clue. <laughs> And so we learn why Mr. Trace calls this case the Peg Leg Man Murder Clue. Be sure and join us next time when we'll hear the old seafarer say, And then we both settled on her side and sank beneath the waves. And I went down with it, fulfilling the unwritten oath of all men. In the next episode of Mr. Trace, Keener Than Most Persons. Sailing the seas, their lives were. And then... I remember about three days after I went down. And hi again, sports fans. This is Biff Burns in the sports room with another guest from the world of sports. Today, delving into the history of uh, one of our great uh, sports we have with us on deck uh, Bim Decker, one of the champion ping pong players of all time. Bim, I'd like to fire away a few questions uh, about the great game of uh, ping pong. Well, I wish you'd fire away, Biff, and I'm here to answer the questions. There's only one correction I'd like to make. It isn't ping pong. Table tennis is what tennis. I uh, play. It's so quite a difference. Ping pong is just a 21 game. Table tennis, you play your regular tennis. Right. Well, that 15 was love, 30 love, deuce, and so forth. One of the uh, add questions in, add I out. was going to fire at you here, so I'll have to find the second question. With ping pong, you see, you just play first one against 21 points. It's kind of for kids, I think. Table tennis is regular tennis played on a small scale before a little crowd. You're listening to Bim Decker, one of the outstanding uh, all-star table tennis champs of uh, all time. Bim, I understand that... Your left-handed backstroke has never been equaled by anyone in the game. Well, I'm one of those fellows who can play with either uh, hand. I uh, sometimes flip the paddle over to my right hand or my left hand, 
Naturally, uh, I'm a right-hander. But uh, on occasions, I can give you a mean uh, left-handed forehand, or as you pointed out, my left-handed left hand, backhand, left hand. or backhanded left hand. Right, right and back. standing back as far as you do in those championship matches, you have plenty of time to switch from right to left. Well, we stand back pretty far. It's because we wail that old pill. You can get hit with one of those, you know. It's I understand so that, uh, Bim, you've been out of the uh, ranks of the professionals for this past season. Uh, you had a recurrence of an old ailment, did you? That's right. I have a uh, hammer toe on one of my feet. My second toe is a hammer toe on my right foot. Uh -huh. And also, I swallowed a ping pong ball uh, earlier in the campaign. And it should, of course, uh, make for a little bit tough going for a while. Tell me this, uh, who is the toughest opponent you've ever come up against in championship competition? By that, I mean you've met the best in the field. I uh, would like to know just who you rate as the toughest opponent. Well, I've read where they call me my own worst enemy. I'd, I'd say that I uh, probably, uh, uh, myself, when I'm off, is uh, the worst fellow I've met up against. You yourself. Well, that's uh, I don't mean to say that I haven't played other good players, but I think that I'm my own worst enemy. As far enemy as the bad there. players go, you're your own worst enemy. That's right, I am. I know there are a lot of uh, youngsters uh, listening in, Ben, who would like to one day grow up and uh, pass from ping pong to table tennis and become a champ like yourself. What would you advise them to do to uh, reach that height? Well, you can't get started too early, I'd start by saying to the kids. Uh, now's the time to pick up a ping pong ball, get to know the paddle. Uh, play uh, ping pong, table tennis every chance you get. Play fair. Uh, play honest, play hard, play spirited. When you grow up... Uh, Bam, I hate to do this, I hate to interrupt, but I see I'm getting a signal that our time is just about up. Before you go, I'd like to serve you up a real uh, hard, fast one and uh, have you give the folks a demonstration of that quick return of yours. Here it comes. Oh, oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, it lodged in uh, Bim's mouth. He had his mouth open, and uh, we'll have to uh, attend to that after we leave the air. Sorry, Bim, uh, that's about all we have time for in the sports room now, fans. Until next time, this is Biff Burns saying, until next time, this is Biff Burns saying so long. Welcome again to the Insomniac Theater. Today, the soundtrack from another great picture of yesterday, the 1932 success, The Desperate Man. A story about a desperate bank robber who attempts to pull off his last job. We'll begin in just one minute no, after no. this word. Uh, no, we're going to begin now because they couldn't sell anything. So oh. we got no commercials, so they can oh. start it right now. We'll begin right now with... What do you mean you don't... Wait, hold it just a second. You don't have it threaded? Uh, do you have any uh, announcement there about uh, don't yes, start I, uh, I can, forest fires? Yes, I can fill here okay. with something. The leading role is portrayed by Worthy Dunphy, his wife by Martha Oldsweet. I wonder where they are now. And... Just a reminder that some of your neighbors may have retired, so keep the sound low. A lot of them have moved. And now, here is the soundtrack from the 1932 motion picture, The Desperate Man. Stretch it. He still doesn't have it threaded. Well, that's all the material I have. Wow. I, uh, here, <clears throat> read this announcement. The time... Uh, oh, they have it now? All right, here it is. Just about time for the big bank wobbly. Well, I wish you wouldn't do it. Well, we need the money if we're ever going to get that little chicken farm we've been planning on. But, Lawrence, if you had only worked, you could have accumulated enough money to buy any chicken oh, farm. Oh, I know, I know, but this is a surefire thing. All we got to do is walk into the bank, pull the heist, and then make the split up, and we're all set. We'll be set for life. Suppose you get caught. We won't get caught, dear. We got this thing too well planned out. Who are you pulling this job with? I'm pulling it with Eddie, Charlie, uh -oh. Dick, Jimmy, Bim, Roscoe, and let's see, there's one other guy. I think there's too many, too many in there. One is bound to squeal. One will sing to the cops. You well, know that, Lawrence. You gotta let me go through with this. You know, Martha. the more cooks and the crummy broth, you've heard that. I know what you mean, but we got this thing all planned. Well, I better be leaving. I'll meet you tomorrow and we'll get that chicken farm. <laughs> Ooh. 
Uh, you know what you're going to do now, Lawrence? Yeah, uh, I know, uh, Roscoe. You're going to sit in the car. Why? Keep the motor humming there, okay, boy. Okay, good luck, fellows. Okay, Lawrence. There Please. they go into the bank. Yeah? You go right over and knock off the teller. I'll okay, take care right. <clears throat> okay, give me all your money. What is right this? Right in this bag. Yeah, this is up? a hold-up. That's right. Right in this bag. Well, you've hit us at a good time. Almost six million dollars. Yeah, we $1 know. One dollar bills here. We know, yeah, they're unmarked, too. Yeah, that's right. We had this figured out, Pally. Okay, I got it, Roscoe. Come on, he set off the alarm. Hurry up. Why, you? Come on, we don't have time. What's the matter, fellas? Run into some trouble? Get this heat rolling. Come on, Come on hurry Lawrence. up, Lawrence. Let's go. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we are. Stop I'll pull right in here, right here by the front door. Good. Okay, right. let's get out. Well, when do I get paid off so I can get my chicken farm? You're going to get yours pretty soon now, Lawrence. Oh, yeah, we're going to pay you off good. Come on inside. Yeah, yeah. Close the door. Wow, it's a pretty good hideout. Sit down, Lawrence. Boy, that's a lot of loot you got there. Now, More money than you've ever seen before. Who's going to give him his, uh, Roscoe? I don't know. I yeah, thought who's maybe... going to give me mine? I thought maybe uh, you could take him in the next room and give it to him good. Hey, that's a good idea. Give it to him with uh, with a little dividend. With interest, huh, Roscoe? <laughs> <laughs> Come that's on, right. Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, well, you don't need to give me any interest just as long as I get my share. That's you're all. going to get it the oh, minute you get in that room. Get it. Don't worry. Don't worry none, Lawrence. Oh, well, okay. Give it to him good, Eddie. As long as I get it. Good. I will. So we come to the end of today's feature soundtrack in the Insomniac Theater, the 1932 film, The Desperate Man in which Worthy Dunphy proved once again that crime does not pay, along with his wife, Martha Olstry. Be sure and join us next time for another soundtrack in the Insomniac Theater. It was very interesting. Now, let's see what this is. Take time out to enjoy a little refreshment. Tony, what do we have for the folks today, huh? Well, that's right, Arthur. This is eating time. We have uh, some rye bread for everybody sent over from the Rye Bread Institute. That's Arthur. good, that's good. What else? Jelly donut, Arthur. A jelly donut, huh? That's right, Arthur. <laughs> sent over from the Jelly Institute. So it shouldn't be a total loss. That's what right, else? Arthur. This is National Antifreeze Week. Everybody get a little paper cup full of antifreeze? Well, we forgot that, Arthur. And this is National Save the Horse Week. That's right, well, Arthur. We got a couple of beauties I want to bring out for you now. Would you lead that that Arabian stallion out here, please? It's a beautiful horse, Arthur. Isn't he a beauty? That's right, Climb up on him, Tony. Just show the folks, huh? Well, uh... We got the high hurdle set up over there at the far end of the studio. Well, Arthur, and I want to show you what a jumper this steed is. He's he, he's tame. You get up on him there. Well, Arthur, I'm, uh... May fall off. Uh, you won't fall off. H hang on to the reins there, see? He, he can do this well, how do you get by up himself. Off? Just up. That's the way. Now, now start out and take the high hurdle, Tony. <laughs> Missed it that time. I'd like to get down now, old. Oh. You're down, boy. <laughs> that was all right. You notice how that horse just seemed to know how to take the hurdle there all by himself. Tony. Oh, Tony. <laughs> well, let's get on with the show then, huh? Somebody get him out. We call in correspondent Wally Ballou at the Detergent Box Derby, Uphill Falls, Oregon. W. Ballou at the Detergent Box Derby. As we have uh, reason to believe you've been told that they push these little wagons that they have built themselves up 
Liz Hill. Just a correction here, Wally. Here's they Eddie's haven't uh, hard, ladies and point gentlemen. out uh, that uh, rather than mislead the public, they all these kids did not build these themselves. They could have help from their fathers. I think that it's probably proper that uh, we mention that, uh, Wally. Lulu, uh, from my vantage point, a scene of panoramic beauty spread out uh, up ahead of me. And you're right, Artie. And as a matter of fact, looking over these little cars, I would say that in 90% of the cases, the old man uh, made it for the youngster. Uh, just a correction on your figures. Uh, before we went on the air, uh, Wally, I took time out to check with the chairman of the derby. It tells me that there were only four fathers, actually, who helped any of these kids. I well, considering there are only five in the race, I would say that was pretty near 90%. Well, uh, actually, it wouldn't be 90%, you know. Uh, if you know your mathematics, Wally, uh, that would be one... Excuse me th just a minute, Artie. I think uh, it's been made known to you now uh, that out of the five who started, only four are expected to finish. One dropped out. Well, uh, that's true. However, uh, I think I was still correct, uh, Wally. Uh, in saying that there were five uh, uh, contestants vying for the honors here at the detergent <laughs> box derby. <laughs> well, at that time, yes. When I said 90% of the contestants' cars had been built by their fathers, uh, there were five, and I was wrong. But now, actually, 100% of the four contestants still in the running uh, cars were built by their fathers. That's all I just wanted to say that, Artie. Right, and I think probably the term <laughs> running is wrong, Wally. Uh, Oh. You know, these are just uh, regular boxes, and uh, there is no motor in them, oh, and they, they're pushed uphill. Uh, so right. I think when you say oh, running right. in the race, I well, think that's a uh, running <laughs> a I used term. as a purely rhetorical phrase. That's right. I didn't uh, mean I that the cars are running by themselves <laughs> or under any power uh -huh. from anybody else. Well, it's just that so long as you're on the air and people would like to know exactly what's going on, I think if you used a better choice of words, it probably would have... just added to me. It says, get on with the description of this detergent box derby, and I think that's a good idea. Take it away, Artie Skerberhide. Thank you, Wally Baloo, for my vantage point. They're now about a third way up the uphill falls. This hill rises about 700 feet. They started, uh, oh, scarcely 40 minutes ago. I would estimate that they are have accomplished probably 300 yards. All these little fellas who are well, pushing just a minute, the... Artie Skerberhide. The entire race is only 280 yards. Uh, therefore, they couldn't have accomplished 300 yards at this time. Now look, uh, Wally, if you'd care to take just a little time out to take a look at the map that was handed to both of us by the I committee the, here. I have the map right here. All right, I... just take a look at it now. Does that look like 200 yards to you, fella? Hey, it looks like 200, but I'm told it's 280 yards, and I don't think there's any need to argue about it while we're on well, the Well, I, I, I don't think you should. Well, well, you do. Every time we do a remote broadcast, you try to make an idiot out of me, Wally. I'm not trying to make any idiot out of you, Artie, any more than you're already doing. Uh, when you say that 280 yards is the same as 200 or 300. Go ahead, Wally. That's all I have to say from my vantage point. Oh, that's all you have to say. Now, instead of a traffic report and stock market thing and all that, we bring you another episode of One Fellow's Family. Today's episode, entitled Garage Trouble, or rather Garage Trouble, is taken from Book V, Chapter II, page 235. As we look in on the family now, we find that Mother... Well, family, I finally got the rose bushes trimmed. Well... Just in time, too, it looks like snow. Hmm. Yeah. It's a shame we didn't have one rose this summer, didn't we? Well, that's what comes of trimming them too close, like I did last year. Well, what? why don't you let them be? Yeah. They're so small now, you've pruned them almost even with the earth. I thought I might call up the rose hybridizer and find out just whether I'm doing it right or wrong, Andy. I forget what kind of roses those are out there. Well, they're some kind of... But well, didn't we roses? have the Reza Stevens rose there one year? Well, all I can remember is the Bob Perkins rose. That was a beauty. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we'll get any message from Jack today. 
I don't know, but didn't we have a wonderful holiday, though? Yes, it was a more very I delightful. More I think of it, and the weekend of following was so exciting. All of the children were here, Hanky and Panky. Yes. Stinky and Blinky. And Slinky. And Slinky, the twins. <laughs> nice to have the whole family, <coughs> the whole family together yes. for Thanksgiving. Well, it certainly will be quiet this week. You got a cold coming no, up. It's smoke of some kind, Fanny. Are you smoking, Fanny? I haven't smoked for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well this will be a quiet weekend compared to last. It should be, Fanny, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to put my rose trimmers away. Well, all right. <coughs> well, I'll Where's just... Where's the door uh, to, the, to the cellar, Fanny? It's right over there by the back yeah. entryway. I think maybe I'll go out and check the garage for trouble. I think... This is, where is all this smoke coming from? It's coming from the garage, Fanny. Somebody left the radio on with all that fool noise. I'll go turn off the radio. Yeah, yeah. And you go see if there's any garage trouble. You've been listening to One Fellow's Family. <coughs> Brought to you instead of a traffic report and a stock market roundup. <coughs> Stuff like that. Studio full of sport. <clears throat> Today's episode entitled At the Seashore, or rather, Garage Trouble, which was the episode? The Garage story? Trouble, announcer. Garage Trouble, <laughs> taken from one of the books that T. Wilson Messy has. I can't read my notes, it's too smoky in here. It's a messy production. <laughs> And once again, hello, ladies. This is your True to Life announcer, Danny. All right, Sitting Danny. Now, Danny's uh, True to Life kitchen. What, Danny, Danny, I want you to cut it short because the last time you talked so much, I couldn't finish my story. Well, I just like a handful of these cookies, Aunt Well, Penny. take them, Danny, and dry up. Now, what's our True to Life story about today? Today's story about Ms. and Mrs. Lawrence Hedges. And Penny, do you mind Tonight, if I raise be... the shade? It's a little oh, too Oh, Danny, now here. don't get going on that shade again. I do want to tell the story about Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Hedges. All right. Well, Larry, he was called. He worked for the railroad, and he decided one day that he and the missus would go east. And rather than take the railroad, they thought they'd drive off in their new automobile. This is many years ago, and they had a whippet. And they get in the whippet. Did that make it go better, Aunt Penny? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Danny, we won't have time for those puns. Now, let me get along with the story. Well, Mr. and Ms. Lawrence Hedges departed from their home in Mason City, heading east in their whippet. Right outside of town was the great coursing river known as the Big Stream. And as they started to cross over the stream... Say, Mrs. Lawrence Hedges, does this bridge look safe to you? Yes, it does, Mr. Hedges. doesn't to me. It's kind of waving in the breeze, kind of like, oh, Mrs. Hedges. don't seem to be waving any more than any other bridge would wave in the breeze. No, but see how the cables... Keep your eye be... on the road rather than looking at the cables. If you don't mind, we do want to get east, don't we, to Metropole to visit our neighbors? I know one thing, though, Miss Lawrence Hedges. I wish we were on the other side of this bridge instead of right in the middle of it. I'd feel a lot safer on dry land than I do here in this automobile driving over this shaky bridge. Hey, I'll do whatever you want to do, Hedges. I don't care. I'll just sit here. Well, we've come so far, we might as well proceed to the other side, Miss Hedges. Oh. Well, Danny, Mr. Great Hedges, Scott, he Penny. managed to save himself. Sounded he like the bridge off. gave away. What the happened? The last he saw was Ms. Hedges on the top of the whippet going downstream faster than they were going when they were driving it on dry land. Well, that certainly he was. He could swim. Fortunately, he saved himself. And that's about it. Well, that was a wonderful true-to-life story, Aunt Penny, and I know that all the ladies will be anxious to hear your next one. Yes, and if Ms. Hedges is listening, won't you write and tell me how you were saved? And that's about it, ladies. Time's up, Aunt Penny, and until next time, she says... If anyone knows how that dear lady ever made out in all that trouble floating down the river and all, I wish they'd let me know. And this is Danny saying so long, ladies, until oh, next time. Oh, dry up. What a windbag, honestly. Your sanitation department in action. My name is Reginald Daddle Poop Jr. My job, keep the city clean. Keep the city streets clean. Each day, my partner and I 
pick up garbage and trash that people throw out. One morning last summer, we were rolling down 2nd Avenue in a great big truck, and... Hey. <clears throat> yeah, Sam. Or Fred. It's kind of gamey. Well, it's a warm day. Got your lunch with you? Yeah, it's... I got it in the glove compartment. <clears throat> Gee, I hate to pick up stuff from a fish market on a day like this. Boy, this traffic is miserable, isn't it? Who'd One be thing eating I hate fish? is traffic. Who'd be eating fish on a day like that? Yeah. Well, I guess the fish markets go on and on. Yeah, it's the hum of a big city, the activity that has to go on to keep the city moving. Sure like to get back on Grand Central again. Just stabbing papers. That was a good run, Fred. Boy. Remember I used to get home by 4.30, play with the kids, take a quick dip... Now it's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. The lights used to be staggered along here, didn't they? Yeah, it seems like. Well... There's a red light here. we got to stop. It's a stop anyway. Who's got to... Any garbage today? It's your any turn garbage? to heave the barrel, Fred. Any garbage, sir? No, he doesn't have any garbage. Thing looks empty. Let's lights roll. Lights turn green. Let's go. Let's roll. <laughs> We must have about half a load by now. We can't go back with half a load, on. No, the chief would really blow us off. Here's a trash can. Let's pull up here. Whose turn is it to hurl a barrel? I'll jump down. Hey, do you need an umbrella? What do you mean? It's not raining. No, but it's a pretty good umbrella. It's okay. It's got one hole in it. I'll take it. Sure. Throw it up here in the... Treasure box. You wear 11 and a half shoe, don't you? No, nine and a half. Nine and a half? Any of the kids wear these? Yeah, my oldest kid does. Yeah, they're curled up. They've been wet. If they dry out, they'll be okay. I'll kid. take them. Sure. Here. Yeah. Hey, what's that over there? That, that looks pretty good. Tie. Oh. But it's the old-fashioned kind, the wide kind. Yeah. No need to wear the wide ones anymore. No. Heck with it. One thing I like is narrow ties. Narrow ties and horizontal stripes. That's for me. Don't find those in the rubbish cans anymore. Hey, here's a wicker basket. It's got a hole in it, too. In fact, it's got no bottom at all, Fred. Probably grow flowers or something in it. Yeah, I'm making a nice plant. Yeah, take it. Put it in. Well, let's roll. And so, once again, your sanitation department men in action, have presented another little-known side of their lives. Be sure and listen to the next episode when we'll hear Fred say... Are you hungry? On your sanitation department in action. Time now for Sea Search. The stirring adventures of freelance skin diver Lloyd Bricker and his diving partner Lance Spears. Today's episode, titled Perforated Eardrums, takes place near their home base, Catalina Island. Well, let's uh, hustle aboard the skiff, Lance. We've got three other jobs just like this today in different parts of the harbor. Yeah, there's been a rash of these things lately. It seems like the only kind of assignment we get. You think a guy who spends five to six hundred dollars for a new outboard motor would learn how to fasten it on his boat properly? Yeah, you'd think so. They no sooner get away from the pier than the thing shakes off, sinks to the bottom, and we got a fish for it. Where did the guy say that first one fell off? Well, he didn't uh, say exactly, Lloyd. Uh, just out near the middle somewhere. Mm-hmm. Middle of what? The harbor, the bay, the ocean, or what? I think he said the bay. Said he marked the spot by pouring some oil on the water, like in the submarine pictures. Well, that'll be a big help. This bay is full of oil slicks, and with the current, it's probably moved some. Oh, uh, we're near the middle. Why don't we try around here? You never know. Okay. Good luck, fella, and... You see a shark down there, belt him on the snout with a heavy, blunt object. Well, it's not my turn. I found the last five of these things, and you never even got your toes wet. Well, never mind the arguing. We've got a busy day ahead, Lance. Oh, boy, I knew you were going to pull this the minute you showed up on board in your business suit. This suit helps me make a good impression when I look for freelance diving assignments. Well, it hasn't helped because I land most of the jobs wearing a T-shirt. How can you expect to get diving work hanging around the track? you got to cover the waterfront. Look, I cover the waterfront, but that's beside the point. You know, I 
I can't dive in water deeper than 12 feet. The pressure against my perforated eardrums could give me a permanently waterlogged brain, the doctor said. Oh, you've had that for a long time. If you were a real guy, you'd buy a pair of earplugs. Maybe you're afraid you'd have to dive. <laughs> now, that's not true. You know I've tried to buy them, but they never have them for my size ears. Yeah, a pair of sink stoppers would do the job, but you're too particular. All right, get off my back, will you, buddy? Look, I'll dive on the next job. Now, you know my word is good. As good as an empty aqualung. Hey, that reminds me, did you remember to put air in the lungs today? Gee, no, I thought you were going to do it. Boy, is this caper turning into a fiasco. If you were any kind of a guy, you'd dive holding your breath. You know that if I hold my breath, I get heartburn. That's just like swimming after a big meal. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I say if a guy's stupid enough to drop his outboard motor in the drink, it's his tough luck. That's what I say. Let's split. Tune in next time for another exciting sea search story entitled Cockles, Muscles, Alive, Alive, O. When you'll hear Lloyd Bricker say... Now, listen, Lance. I only said my word is good, not great. On Sea Search, an El Guco production. Friends, the Bob and Ray Manufacturer's Outlet has a special sensational offer today. Now, this is not to be confused with our usual sensational overstock surplus warehouse. No, this is a special chance of a lifetime. Not to be confused with the ordinary chance of a lifetime we offer you each week. At our Manufacturer's Outlet, you buy directly from the manufacturer. Now, these remarkable savings are made possible by our extremely low overhead. At our Manufacturer's Outlet, the overhead's so low... You may have to <laughs> stoop a little. Now, if you can't come yourself, send a friend. Preferably a short friend. And right now, we're having a special sale of all wool suits at the lowest possible price. These savings are made possible because these all wool suits come to you directly from the manufacturer. There's no middleman. You deal directly with the manufacturer. When you buy one of these all wool suits, here's how it works. You negotiate directly with the sheep. You see... We have no exp expensive showrooms, no fancy fixtures. Just a big sheep shed and a salt lake out of the high-rent district. That's right, folks. And by doing away with expensive showrooms and fancy fixtures, we pass these savings on to you. But, of course, you have to pay for these ads which tell you how we keep our costs so low. And when you drop down to Manufacturer's Outlet, ask for our good friend, generous Joe Sturdley. You'll recognize him by his snowy white T-shirt and deck sneakers. And the silly grin on his face. Here's a man with us who has a story that's practically unbelievable and uh, certainly points up the fact that there are new horizons available today. What's your name, sir? Uh, Frank Liberace. Well, now, uh, as I understand your story, two weeks ago, you were worth somewhere around $150. Yeah, that that's right? right, counting my uh, jacket and my Geiger counter and uh, my uh, high leather shoes. Well, there's the tip off that Geiger counter because here is a real life uranium prospector who this morning tells me he is worth $350 million. All of this within two weeks time. Would you tell us a story Mr. Liberace? Yes. Uh, last fall uh, I went down to uh, in New York Abercrombie and Fitch mm -hmm. and I bought a Geiger counter and an outdoor jacket and went up to Canada and I had about $80 in my pocket and I got off the train there and went at the woods and you had never prospected before? No, you? I didn't even know how to go about it, and the machine started to tick, and I bought that land, and now I'm... Well, I was worth $350 million, 11 o'clock Eastern time. That's 15 minutes ago. Oh, I'm worth four now. Four million? Yes. $50 million in that short time. Well, how does it feel to be such a wealthy... Uh, well, feels yeah. very good. <clears throat> I'll bet it does. Yes. And have you made any plans for how you're going to spend the money? Going well, to... I want to get... Uh, one of the first things I want to do is... Uh, I want to get a haircut. Yeah. And uh, I want to buy uh, some marshmallows. I love them. Marshmallows? Mar mm -hmm. That's right. And I uh, also thought that I would get a shoe shine. Well, you've certainly figured out uh, every angle, I guess, how you're going to spend your money and everything. That's right. Real good story. Thank you very much for telling Thank it Thank you us. very much. Well, it's book review time now, and uh, here is our Bob and Ray book editor, Webley Webster. Hello again. Webb, uh, that's a big tome you brought with you today. Oh, what a night I had. Huh? No, I mean that book. Oh, yeah, well, that's why I'm here. I have been reading what I think is one of the most interesting books I have ever read. That's so? Who's it by? By some fella. 
And it's called Cinderella. Cinderella, huh? That's right. Recently hit the stands. Oh, no, no. You're wrong there. This oh. has been around for a few oh, years. Oh, is that so? Yes. Well, I didn't know, but I just read it. The scene that I brought the Webley Webster players along to do is in the fifth chapter. Mm-hmm. It's where Cinderella is on a pirate ship. Thing, what? And uh, one of the meanest, crankiest, Pirates you've ever seen with the captain of this tub. Well, wait, I I read Cinderella once. I saw it in the movies. Yeah, too. Uh, this is the one about the glass slipper. And yeah, I mean, she had a glass slipper and all yeah, that, and, I, a, and a fairy godmother. Well, yes, I but mean, the, oh, uh, the mutiny and and pirates and things. Well, yes. Well, uh, the players are all set to act it out, so go right ahead. Right. Matey. Aye, aye, Captain. When I yell, I want you to come right up here. Well, I came on deck as soon as I could, Captain. Why, you... No, no, no. Taking it easy, Captain. Now get up off the deck, matey. Oh, yeah. You're traveling with me now, you know. I know that, you sir. You want a little respect. How does the sky look? I'll thank you to tell me right away, matey. It looks stormy, sir. Why, you... No, no. I... I don't want no stormy skies on a night like this, matey. Well, I don't have nothing to do with the weather, Captain. Why? No, no. Don't want none of that funny talk to me. This is the captain you're talking to, matey. I know that, Captain. I was only trying to explain why I wasn't been able to do nothing about the weather. Why? No. No. Now, what'll a good... Good chef have for us down in the galley tonight, matey. I think it's Bean, sir. Why? No. <laughs> oh, you can see that that's an exciting book from cover to cover. Cinderella. Cinderella, look, you look for These actors of yours are in a rut, I'll tell you that much. And it's awful good. You look for it. Cinderella. I he couldn't wins. put it down. Hmm. Bob and Ray on the music scene now as we bring good news to a lot of you older listeners with memories that go back to the great Irene Fleming Getchell Orchestra. Here with us are the McBeebe twins, and I just want to let you fellas uh, tell us the story because it's a real thrill what you have to say, and well, I know a lot uh, of music fans will welcome it. Yes, Bob, it's, Bob, it's, uh, it's uh, a big, big thrill for, thrill us, to for us to be here and to, and to uh, bring you the bring wonderful, you the wonderful news, news, that news that we bring. We, we have, have obtained, obtained through the executives of the, of the uh, uh, late Irene Fleming Getchall, Getchall uh, permission, uh, permission to use all, all her old arrangements and her instruments, bandstand, uniforms, and gowns. <laughs> well, I, I should think for the McBeebe twins and their orchestra, this would be a, a great step uh, in getting back to the music field, although I don't think the gowns would come in handy. Well, uh, I'll, uh, no, no, but our wives, but, uh, can, wives use can use them. But as, but you, as remember, you remember, Irene, Irene Fleming, Fleming Getchall, Getchall was the was leading, leading girl, girl orchestra, orchestra leader, leader back in the, back swing, in the swing era. era. I sure do. There aren't many people of our age who don't remember the great evenings listening uh, on the radio to that uh, Getchall band and uh, going out to some of the ballrooms and actually dancing to it. She died in 1938, I believe. Yeah, she yeah, was, she was stabbed, stabbed by a sliding, stabbed by trombone. sliding trombone. Yeah, that was during uh, an overseas tour. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, actually uh, their orchestra, uh, was, their orchestra was, entertaining was entertaining a few entertaining native, a few native uh, out in the uh, Pacific. Pacific. It was before, it was before any war, uh, or war or anything. Well, now, what instrumentation do you Very have? Very uh, interesting, Bob. Interesting, Bob. Bob. There's a player, There's a player piano, piano, harpsichord, harpsichord triangle, triangle, two flugel, two flugel horns, horns. There are uh, four saxophones, four, saxophones, uh, two valve trombones, trombones, four double bell euphonians, three, uh, three Iranians, Iranians, a tuba. tuba. <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh, Sounds uh, interesting, right? Uh, French, horn, French horn, electric horn, electric horn and the and electric, electric Russian, Russian caviar. Russian caviar. That's uh, certainly a different grouping of instruments. I don't think more than one or two are used in many of the bands. Stan Kenton, I know, has uh, melophonians, but uh, yes. this should make for different sound, all right. The, uh, the executives, uh, executives have insisted the, honey, that we, uh, uh, we, uh, when uh, we, conduct we conduct the band, band we'll have to we'll hold a class, class champagne. champagne. <laughs> that just seems as silly. Miss Getchall just did. Just as way uh, Irene Fleming yes, Getchall always did. They always did. I remember she used to stand there in front of the... What was that for, do you know? I think she I wanted think to get she loaded. Wanted to get Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, you've got your itinerary lined up for the yeah. next few months. That's right. That's right. We, we start at Attu, then we move then over, we to, move Kiska, over to Kiska, then we go then south, south to Nome, Nome Anchorage, Anchorage, and down, and down Vancouver, into Vancouver, Seattle, Seattward, Seattle, 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 Seattle to Portland, 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 Eugene, Eugene Oakland, Oakland, San Francisco, San Francisco 
Modesto, Modesto Sherman, Sherman Oaks, Oaks, Encino, Van Nuys. Van Nuys. Then we take the number three bus, three bus to Hollywood, to Hollywood where we'll be arrested. arrested. Uh huh. Uh, folks in the West Coast area can look forward to seeing the uh, new McBeebe Twins Orchestra with the late great Irene Fleming no, Getchell arrangements. The billing has, the billing to, be has to be the McBeebe, the McBeebe Twins, Twins conducting, conducting the late, the late Irene, Fleming Irene Fleming Getchell, Getchell Orchestra. Orchestra. And their and gowns. gowns. Well, it'll be an interesting uh, thing to see. All of your friends will be looking for it. Thank you, McBeebe Twins. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Aren't, you, Aren't excited? you excited? Well, it's not going to be uh, long before we're in the midst of uh, political conventions. And as a sidelight to uh, convention news, we thought you might be interested in meeting our next guest. We've asked to drop by today Dr. Sherman Y. Maycroft, who has been hired by uh, one of the parties, and we're not at liberty to mention which one, uh, to give advice to speakers who will be making addresses during convention. Dr. Maycroft, welcome to our Bob and Ray booth. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I... I wonder if, uh, first of all, you tell us exactly why you were hired uh, by the party and what you are uh, planning to do. Well, the reason for my being hired by the party, G, D, D, is to teach the orators, tors, tors, how to speak, eek, 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 when there is no PA system where they are speaking. Ing, 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 ing. In other words, uh, when they make stops on trains or uh, greet people at uh, uh, unusual places where there are no microphones, no public address system, you teach them to speak so that they will sound as if there is. Is that right? That's right. Right, right, right. Well, there seems to be quite an art to this. How long have you been doing this sort of thing, and how did you start, Dr. Maycroft? Well, it all started uh, when I uh, was up at uh, the Yankee Stadium for an old-timers game. Aim, 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 aim. Uh, one of the sportscasters was standing by second base, ace, 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 and introducing some of the old stars. Ours, 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 ours. And it hit me then. There, there, there. You felt that there was a crying need for someone to train uh, people to talk that way. I felt that way, a eh, eh, eh. Do you talk this way all the time, Dr. Maycroft? No, or? just to emphasize uh, what I teach. H, 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 H. Well, would you give us just a little sample of uh, the opening lines of a speech after the uh, student has taken your course in uh, public speaking without a microphone? My dear voters, stirs, 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 when you march, arch, arch, arch to the polls, old, 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 on Tuesday next, X, 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 I think we get the idea. You'll place I'm your sure you'll ballot. Let, let, it's going to be let. very prominent in the uh, weeks to come. Thank you, Dr. Sherman Y. Maycroft, for being our guest here today. You're entirely welcome. Come, come, come.